In the early afternoon of July the 17th, 2014, a Boeing 777-200 of Malaysia Airlines departs Amsterdam Airport Schiphol for Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The flight is prepared as usual, and the aeroplane is in an airworthy condition. On board of flight MH17 are 283 passengers and 15 crew members. The routing of this flight leads via Germany, Poland and Ukraine to the east, a standard routing to Asia that many airlines use. Flight MH17 enters Ukrainian airspace at an altitude of 33,000 feet, following airway Lima 980. The crew diverts a short distance to the north to avoid some thunderstorms when returning to the airway in the eastern part of Ukrainian airspace. In this region, an armed conflict between the Ukrainian government and armed groups is in progress. Therefore, lower levels of the airspace are restricted for civil air traffic. Flight MH17 is routed above this restricted airspace to waypoint Romeo November Delta in the Russian Federation. Until that moment, the flight proceeds normally. When flight MH17 is above the eastern part of Ukraine, a Buck surface-to-air missile system fires a missile. It travels almost at three times the speed of sound and carries a 9N314M model warhead. Inside it is an explosive core surrounded by two mantles containing preformed iron fragments. Radar guides it to its target, where it is detonated by means of a proximity fuse. A Buck surface-to-air missile can reach an altitude of 80,000 feet, exceeding the flight altitude of flight MH17 by far. At 20 minutes and 3 seconds past 1, this warhead explodes to the left and above the cockpit of MH17. About 800 preformed fragments perforate the aeroplane. This impact, combined with the blast of the explosion, causes the cockpit and the business class section to separate. As it descends, the aeroplane disintegrates. This film shows the international investigation into this crash, conducted by the Dutch Safety Board. Flight MH17 disappeared from the radar at 20 minutes and 3 seconds past 1 UTC. Very soon, the first reports were made of wreckage falling down in the eastern part of Ukraine. In an area of about 50 square kilometers, six sites were identified where parts of the aeroplane came down. Wreckage of the cockpit in the forward section of the aeroplane crashed at the sites near Rozipna and Petropavlivka. The aft and tail sections ended up about 8 kilometers eastwards, near the village of Grabov. The middle section of the aircraft was destroyed by an intense fire at the main crash site. None of the 298 occupants survived the crash. The Ukrainian National Investigation Bureau, NBAAI, commenced an investigation the same day. Because of the considerable number of Dutch passengers, the Dutch Safety Board decided to send a team to Ukraine the next morning. They arrived in Kiev on the evening of the 18th. On July 23rd, Ukraine delegated the investigation to the Netherlands, and the NBAAI requested the Dutch Safety Board to conduct the investigation. This investigation was conducted according to the standards and recommended practices of ICAO, the United Nations International Civil Aviation Organization. The investigation consisted of accredited representatives of seven states and initially started its work from Kiev. Later on, the investigation was continued from The Hague in the Netherlands. Chairman Joustra explains why the Dutch Safety Board conducted this investigation. The investigation established in detail the exact causes of the crash. It presents the facts and speculation is removed. An investigation contributes to aviation safety and will provide clarity to the relatives. Because of the large number of Dutch victims, we naturally wish to contribute to the investigation and to the causes of the crash. When we were asked to conduct the investigation, we were ready to do so. The investigation was made possible thanks, in part, to the efforts and expertise of representatives from the six participating countries.
They met on several occasions and their input has contributed to the quality of the report. The crash site is located in an armed conflict area and access is very limited. Under escort of the OCSC, Ukrainian and Malaysian investigators and the Australian Federal Police were able to pay brief visits to the crash site the first days after the crash. There, many photographs could be taken. After that, it was not possible for investigators to visit the crash site until late autumn. Sections of the cockpit found on the crash site show damage indicating high-energy objects penetrating the aeroplane from the outside. The flight data recorders were handed over and the investigative team transported them to Farnborough in the United Kingdom to retrieve the data. Based on these first findings, the Dutch Safety Board published a preliminary report in September 2014. The first conclusions were No abnormalities were found regarding the aeroplane or crew. No malfunction of any system or oral warning was recorded. Also, no distress messages were received by air traffic control. Radar data showed that no other aircraft was in such close proximity that a mid-air collision could have occurred. Damage to the forward fuselage indicated penetration by high-energy objects from outside the aeroplane. In the autumn of 2014, the first recovery mission for the wreckage took place. From October onwards, preparations were made to recover those parts of the wreckage that were most important and to transport them to the Netherlands for further investigation. During a six-day period, starting on the 16th of November, the Dutch Safety Board recovered hundreds of pieces of wreckage. The wreckage was transported to a railway station in Torres, Ukraine. In the spring of 2015, two wreckage recovery missions followed. Investigators were able to recover additional wreckage from the sites that could not be investigated before. They also received wreckage that was collected by locals. The first convoy of wreckage arrived in the Netherlands at the Hills Orion Air Force Base on the 9th of December 2014. Over the following months, more convoys of wreckage were transported to Hills Orion. Upon arrival, all wreckage was sorted, tagged, photographed in front of a green screen and forensically examined. In a hangar, pieces of the aeroplane were laid out for investigation. All wreckage pieces were examined for failure mechanisms, damage patterns and traces of external objects that could have hit the aeroplane. The investigation of the wreckage led to further evidence of a surface-to-air missile being the cause of the crash of flight MH17. A number of other scenarios, such as internal explosions, gunfire or air-to-air -air missiles, were excluded. Based on the photographs of the wreckage, a two-dimensional reconstruction was made to identify the position of wreckage on the aeroplane's grid. The major fractures were determined on the basis of the wreckage, the photo reconstruction, as well as the location where each part was found. At Hilsa Ryan Air Force Base, the Dutch Safety Board made a three-dimensional reconstruction of the forward section of the aeroplane. First, a frame matching the model of a Boeing 777-200 was built. Over a period of three months, the cockpit and the forward part of the business class were reconstructed. The parts were moved to their exact position and fixed in place. This reconstruction was made to validate and visualize the results of the investigation. It shows the overall picture and places various parts and damages in their context. Looking at the reconstruction, the impact pattern made by the high-energy objects is clearly visible. The reconstruction also demonstrates the effects of the impact and shows the marks where the cockpit was torn from the rest of the fuselage. The high-energy objects that perforated the aeroplane were also found in the bodies of three crew members seated in the cockpit. The preformed fragments have distinctive shapes, cubic and bow tie shaped, and were made of a ferrous metal. Some fragments had traces of aluminium and glass on them, proving that they had perforated the aeroplane from the outside. The two left windows of the cockpit particularly show perforation by preformed fragments, 
many traces of explosives were found on pieces of wreckage. Also, certain traces of paints were found that match paints on parts of a missile that were recovered from the crash site and missile fragments found in the cockpit and the left wing. The retrieved fragments and traces of paint point to a missile carrying a specific type of warhead and launched by a Buck surface-to-air missile system. During the investigation, a number of computer simulations were conducted. These support the surface-to-air missile scenario. The detonation of a 9N314M model warhead was simulated to calculate a point of detonation as well as the damage that could be expected. The warhead exploded on a location in space less than one cubic meter to the left of and above the cockpit, spraying its fragments in a characteristic radial circular pattern originating from the missile. These patterns match the damage found on the reconstructed forward section of the fuselage. Further proof of the detonation position was found in the last milliseconds of the cockpit voice recorder. This contained recordings of three crew microphones and an overhead microphone in the cockpit on separate channels. During the final milliseconds, these microphones recorded a sound peak. Based on the difference in timing of the recordings of the sound peak on these four microphones, a direction could be calculated. Based on the investigation into the detonation of the warhead and the characteristics of both the Boeing 777 and the Buck surface-to-air missile, its possible flight paths were simulated. The calculated area from which the missile was launched measures about 320 square kilometers and is situated in the eastern part of Ukraine. Further forensic research is required to determine the launch location. Such work falls outside the mandate of the Dutch Safety Board. The investigation demonstrated that the aeroplane flew at an altitude of 33,000 feet, which is to say 10.1 kilometers. No abnormalities regarding the aeroplane or crew were found. The flight proceeded normally and no malfunctions of any system or oral warnings were recorded. Also, no distress messages were received by air traffic control. Both flight recorders stopped abruptly at 13.20.03 and from that time the flight crew of MH17 did not respond to air traffic control messages. Flight MH17 disappeared from the radar. The aeroplane was perforated by hundreds of high-energy objects shaped like cubes and bow ties. Many fragments were found in the bodies of the crew seated in the cockpit. Some of them had a bow tie or cubic shape. The left side of the cockpit area shows a characteristic damage pattern. Traces of explosives were found in the wreckage and on the missile fragments found. Paint on fragments found inside the wreckage matches paint on the recovered missile parts. The point of detonation was determined by the spray pattern on the cockpit and by simulations, and was confirmed by the recorded sound peak. The impact and blast resulted in the aeroplane's disintegration. The wreckage of the aeroplane was distributed over six different sites, consistent with the way the aeroplane broke up in the air. Based on these findings, the Dutch Safety Board concludes that Flight MH17 was downed by a 9N314M warhead carried on a 9M38 series missile as installed on a Buck surface-to-air missile system. Other scenarios were investigated and excluded. No other scenario can explain this combination of factors. The findings are conclusive and support each other based on multiple sources. To that end, we have been able to draw well-supported conclusions about the flight and the causes of the crash. The investigation of the wreckage has demonstrated that the aircraft was perforated at high speed by fragments coming from a specific location to the left and above the cockpit. There were indications of this early in the investigation, but the wreckage turned out to be important for verifying and further substantiating those indications. Immediately after the crash of MH17, 
the question rose how it was possible that a scheduled commercial airliner flew over an area that was known to be a conflict zone. The armed conflict in Ukraine progressively expanded to the air, and several military aircraft had been shot down in the previous weeks. According to Ukrainian authorities, two of these aircraft were hit by more powerful weapons that reached higher than before. But none of the parties involved made any connection between the military developments and the possible risks posed to civil aviation. On June 6, 2014, a notice to airmen, or NOTAM, was issued by Ukraine to restrict the airspace over the eastern part of Ukraine up to flight level 260. This was done to protect military aircraft from ground attacks and to let them fly at a higher level. On July 14th, the restriction was raised to flight level 320. Airlines assumed that the unrestricted airspace above this level was safe. Most commercial airlines continued their flights over the region. On July the 17th, until the airspace was closed, 160 commercial flights passed through this area. Three other airliners were in close proximity of MH17 when it disappeared from the radar screens. All over the world there are areas where an armed conflict takes place while the airspace above those areas remain unrestricted. The risk resulting from flying over conflict areas is paid insufficient attention to by operators, authorities and aviation organizations all over the world. This needs to change. Ukraine had sufficient information to close the airspace to civil aviation prior to July 17. None of the parties involved recognized that the armed conflict in the eastern part of Ukraine would entail risks to civil aviation. Passengers should be able to trust the airline to have done everything possible to operate the flight safely. States should ensure that airspace will be closed if it's unsafe to civil aviation. In order to achieve that, information pertaining to risks and threats must be shared by countries and operators. When a civil aeroplane like Flight MH17 crashes, an international investigation on a large scale is set up and conducted according to international rules and standards. During the investigation into the crash of MH17, the investigators paid multiple visits to different states around the world not only to the crash site and to participating investigating parties, but also to Malaysia Airlines headquarters, Boeing and the ICAO meeting about the risks of flight routes over conflict areas. International investigators also visited the Netherlands to work at the Hague office or at the Hilserion Air Force Base. The Dutch Safety Board organized three meetings with the international investigation team. This is in accordance with ICAO procedures. These meetings concerned the investigation into the cause of the crash. The wreckage was examined and the progress and findings of the investigation were discussed. Another meeting focused on the decision-making process pertaining to flight routes above conflict zones. After consulting the accredited representatives of the participating states, the Dutch Safety Board came to the final report. The most important findings. Flight MH17 progressed normally until it was above the eastern part of Ukraine. At 20 past 1 p.m., a 9N314M warhead exploded to the left-hand side of the cockpit of Flight MH17. The missile was fired from a Buk surface-to-air missile system. The impact killed three people in the cockpit and caused structural damage to the forward section of the aeroplane causing it to break up in the air. All 298 occupants lost their lives. Calculations have demonstrated that the missile's trajectory commenced somewhere in a 320 square kilometer area in the eastern part of Ukraine. The Russian Federation concurs with the conclusion that the crash was caused by the detonation of a warhead, but has reservations regarding the missile and warhead type. However, in our judgment, the arguments in the report overwhelmingly support the conclusions as presented.